violence trying to get their name off and their their physical address off of a website. They're these online data brokers and all they do is they publish personal information of people that they pull from court records and from other semi-public and half-public or official sources or less official sources. And um, in the United States, it's very hard to get your name removed and your address information removed from all of these websites. And sometimes I would contact them and I would ask them specifically, I've been contacted by an individual whose life is in danger. Can you take her address down? And I, the, this, the, the lack of caring I got in response uh, was for me shocking and appalling. Um, so, you know, I, I, I always hold that in a heart as a, some of the worst things I've seen as well. Uh, thank you, Rainey. I, I think that is a, a very good example of something very egregious. Uh, it really is hard to say what is the most egregious because it is very contextual and things that might seem small and innocent to one person can be devastating to another. Uh, to pick up a point that was said by Pat earlier, I mean, when you're talking about privacy, particularly about privacy on the internet, context is everything. Uh, the other thing that Rainey w mentioned about the importance of reporting of these events uh, can't be underscored. However, there are lots of privacy violations that go unreported that have devastating effects and we should not forget those. So rather than mention what is the most egregious because uh, it's really hard to pick a winner, I thought I'd mention something that perhaps not everyone is aware of, and that is this notion of tracking and that is becoming more and more prevalent online. And there are a number of ways this can occur. I mean, every time we use the internet, we leave behind digital footprints. And in some, sometimes these are temporary and disappear, but sometimes they become fossils. We also find that the te very technology that we use on the internet or in the mobile space, the very technology leaves these, uh, exposes these digital fingerprints which can be unique to the device or semi-unique and sometimes when combined with other d data can be used to identify the user. I'm going to also follow Rainey's um, example and cite some statistics from another, some more research from the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. So in June this year, in the Web Privacy Census, they crawled 25,000 of the most popular websites and found that 87% have cookies, of which 76% sorry, 76 are third party. They also found that 9% have HTML storage objects and less than 0.0001 had flash cookies. And they also found that 25% of the cookies included names such as UID and GUID, which is suggesting that they're using these as uniquely identifying users. And they also found that the top 100 websites using the Quantast uh, test, you know, statistics all had cookies. So all of the top 100 had cookies. In total, uh, 5,795 HTTP cookies. And interestingly, in terms of trends, they found that flash cookie use is actually falling, but that HTML5 storage usage is increasing. So I, I know now, in, especially in Google Chrome, it's, it's very easy to delete your entire cookie history. And, and I have to say, I, I actually like, you know, if I've been searching for a particular airline ticket between, let's say, Los Angeles and Berlin, and I don't buy it, but uh, two weeks later I get an advertisement for a cheap flight between Los Angeles and Berlin. Isn't, isn't that progress in a way? You, would you like to add, well, comment I, on that, I just wanted to add to this bit of, uh, of tracking because you know, Christian is absolutely right uh, and the Google case is not a great example because I think the thing that concerns me in mobile, as we said, is that it's much more complex and much more difficult. There are so many way, different ways in which you can track an individual with a mobile device. Uh, and I think that I'm sure many people sat here use one of the world's most popular games. I'm not going to name it because I'm not into that game, but you probably use it. It probably involves a, a rubber band. 
uh, right, a little sling. Uh, and that collects your location data. It collects your device identifier. It shares that with up to seven different entities around the world. How are you going to get that data removed from those different databases on which your data sits? I mean, you can't, can you? And this is one of the things. So, so what I, we were having a discussion yesterday, and what I see is, is a failure in policymaking and a failure in industry to really give meaningful choice is leading to the development of some very interesting privacy tools, some of which I'll talk about tomorrow morning. I can't say it all today, otherwise you'll never turn <laughs> up at 10 o'clock tomorrow. But come along and find out what some of these tools are. And I think you need to be aware of these tools because actually it impacts very much on your business models. If you're in the business of collecting data in order to understand your users, in order to offer them better services, in order to give them free services, you need to understand the impact that some of these tools can have. And they're designed to give people better control over the exfiltration of data from their devices. So I think in Google, Chrome, easier, but in other ways, it's not, not on a mobile. Not there yet. And I just want to say that uh you know, studies have been done on user expectations and, you know, there was a, a nice 2009 study that's found that 84% of people when uh, explained, you know, it, would you like to see targeted ads based on websites you have already visited, not the website you're on now, 84% of people were like, no, actually I'm not comfortable with that or I don't like it. So. Um, you know, I think that there's this disconnect between what users want and what advertisers think users want. And I think that when we ultimately create forms of advertisement and, and ways of making the web productive and efficient that actually work for what people's preferences are, it, everybody's going to benefit from it. Um. Okay, I have a question for you, Joe. Go for it. Okay, are you a Mac user? I am a Mac user. Have you heard about the Orbit story? I have heard about the Orbit story. I, I'm very aware of it. OK, well, in case the others in the audience haven't heard about the Orbit story, this was recently in the news. Uh, it was reported that Orbit was uh, displaying more expensive hotel room options to Mac users as opposed to PC users. And not only that, they were also looking at what site you were using to navigate to the Orbit's website. So for example, if you came from a website such as kayak.com, you were considered to be a more private, uh, price sensitive user rather than a user who came from a website such as tripadvisor.com, which is more about uh, ratings and reviews. And so this is an interesting case because not only is it a case about tracking, and it's also a case about identifying a user not as an individual but as a class of individuals which may or may not be captured by most privacy laws in the definition of personal data. Uh, I was aware of that and I thought to myself, well, this is great. I don't see the ads about things that I don't want. I, I mean, I... I I think I'm, uh, I'm definitely in the 16%, I guess. But if given a choice between having an ad for something that I don't want and an ad for something that I might want, I would choose the ad that I might want. But, but this, doesn't this go back to, to trust? I mean, I'm quite happy. I love getting ads. So on Amazon, for example, oh, I've named somebody. There you go. On Amazon, <laughs> I'm quite happy for them to actually understand. And no, I like the fact that they say, hey, Pat, there's this great book, the CD, the whatever that you've missed that you may be interested in. I love that. But actually, I trust them. Why do I trust them? Because I know about their practices. I understand what they're about. But other sites, no. I switch everything off. I disable. I don't allow them to track me. Why? Because I don't have the sense of the same level of transparency. and uh, They haven't created the same relationship of trust. If you have a relationship of trust, then the users are more likely to let you do the things that you want to do that are necessary for you and your business model. Great. Well, let's switch over to another hot topic right now, which is uh, locational privacy with uh, apps syncing with your phone, which you mentioned a little bit. But I, I want each of you to tell us uh, what your organizations are doing currently on that topic. Uh, thank you, Joe. This will give me an opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing to help raise user awareness about 
the kind of information they expose when they go online, it's not really about mobile apps and not really about location data specifically, but it's about the broader picture, which includes those topics. So one of the things that we did earlier this year is we launched the beta version of a digital footprint workshop, which is a practical hands-on training workshop. Bring your laptop or your portable computer and learn how to adjust your browser settings to choose a more privacy respecting um, session. It's important that users learn how to do this themselves so they can adjust the settings depending on the context in which they're using the, the browser. And as an outcome from that workshop, we've also produced a beta version one site called the Internet Society Browser Privacy Site. And the aim is that this will ultimately become a collaborative platform to share ideas and expertise to improve privacy in, in the browser. Uh, we've also been participating this year in the, the Wall Street Journal Data Transparency Weekend, and we worked on the Tossback 2 project, uh, which won the, the category of scanning. The idea of this um, tool is to be able to uh, monitor po uh, terms of services, specifically privacy, for example, on various websites and how they change over time. So, Rainey? Um, so, the, qu the question was, you know, what are our organizations doing specific to location privacy initiatives? So, I would say um, it's a little bit maybe further afield, but perhaps worth bringing in that a lot of the work that EFF does on location privacy is about uh, government seeking access to your location privacy. Uh, so, for example, uh, we uh, put together a yearly report where we examined the policies of major companies, uh, including uh, several major uh, uh, location service providers, uh, apps and such, like Foursquare. Uh, and we, we looked at whether or not if the government asked them for data about a particular user, whether or not, unless they were under a gag order, they would let that user know so that that user could then uh, seek legal counsel uh, if they thought it was appropriate before handing the data over. We also asked them whether or not they were uh, publishing uh, data about how many uh, government requests they were putting out there. So we do a lot of, a lot of work on location specific to government access. Uh, we were amicus on the Jones case, uh, which was a case that found that the police could not um, do uh, ongoing surveillance. They attached a, a, a GPS surveillance device to somebody's car for a very long time, and they were like, well, we didn't think we needed a warrant for it. And the Supreme Court said, well, we really think you do. Um, and so we, we tend to really focus there. Um, in the mobile space, we also have put together uh, a, a mobile privacy bill of rights, uh, which, which goes through issues like access, and, I'm sorry, uh, like transparency about what kind of data is being collected and uh, consent issues. Uh, so we're, we're kind of in that space as well. Um, well, well, in the UK, I was uh, one of four authors of a guide, uh, a location privacy guide, five years ago before sort of GPS and wireless LAN became as prominent as it is. But our organisation, what have we done? We've worked to uh, set up a, uh, to design, to develop these privacy design guidelines for mobile application development. There is a section on location privacy. But I think it's also important that, you know, you question what do we mean by location? I'm not going to get into the law enforcement side, but I could. I mean, location, it's not just where I am now, is it? As, as Christine said earlier, the ability to collect increasing amounts of very detailed, granular data means that location doesn't mean where I am now, it means where I'm not. It means where I'm not normally, or where I'm not, it means I'm not where I'm normally expected to be also. It's also about what I'm connected to. Increasingly, handsets are being sensor-enabled. In a few years' time, or very shortly, you'll have sensor-enabled urban environments. So it's what else I'm connected to, it's who I'm connected to, it's what's around me, it's who's around me, it's who I'm connected to. And it's critically important, and, and context in that matter is really, really important. I mean, for example, there's a smartphone I use, and its camera app is the only app on that device that doesn't display the geolocation indicator to say that it's geo-enabled. So if I take a photo with that, and I'd forgotten that, oh, you know, 30 days ago I, I tagged that photo, then it means that the current photo I take in my house 
where I want to sell some hi-fi gear because I need to raise some money and put it on eBay, it means then that I can just use EFX Viewer and find out that, hey, there's the location. Oh, and Pat's got some gear to sell. We'll rob that. In two weeks' time, I'll go back and uh, we'll steal his new gear because he must be buying some new gear. So what I'd like is to see that more in context. That's the only app on that phone. So, you know, location is increasingly contextual. It's what's important to me. Great. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, you know, Rainey, I had one question for you. Um, most of the, uh, the major websites are, are, of course, for free. And how would you respond to critics of privacy policy who say, hey, if the person doesn't want to share their data, they just shouldn't come to the site? So I think this is about, um, well, I think there, there's a couple of different issues here. And I think one of the major things that's happening is our, our lives are increasingly happening in these online spaces that are controlled by companies who, you know, they don't, they, they have actually First Amendment rights to decide what kind of content they will and won't host, and they, they have the ability to put terms of service on and to change those terms of service at any moment, uh, to, to change their privacy policies years after you've signed up and started handing them information. Uh, and often this, this has this huge uh, effect of, of leaving consumers uh, with very few choices. They've, they signed up with certain expectations or perhaps they didn't even read the privacy policy because they're basically incapable. In you couldn't possibly read every privacy policy of every site you visit. Um, and then you, you've handed your data to this company and now they've changed the terms on you. And you may or may not be able to easily remove your data from them or you, you try to get your data out and you're never able to erase the data that they have. And this kind of creates this, this very terrible situation where the loser is the user, right? The user is the one who's bearing the brunt of these decisions and they have no voice. Um, I don't think that people who care about privacy just shouldn't be able to use the internet. I think that's the wrong solution. I think what we've got to do is we've got to get companies to actually start responding, to compete on privacy, to start offering us um, online forums where we actually have serious choices about how our data is being used and to be way more transparent about it. Um, so I, I'd say that's probably the biggest thing. And you know, part of that is going to be about having more users speak out and be honest about what they want and having advocacy groups uh, pushing for things. Um, or having the FTC crack down or what have you. There's, there's a, a wide range of things to try and prompt companies to do the right thing. And right now, none of those things are doing quite enough to make a difference. Well, I, I, you know, I represent a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, it's as they're building their apps and they're building their sites, they start with the presumption that the customer won't pay for anything, right? And, and so while we can all sit here and talk about Google's misuse of, of data it, 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 because Google has the resources, how is an entrepreneur in this audience supposed to, to build a site and monetize that site or build an app and monetize that app if they don't have the ability to use the data and they know that consumers will never pay for it? So they do have the ability to use the data. That's the thing. The problem is when consumers don't have any comprehension of what's going on, right? I think most of us, we go to the site and we say, oh, it's free. Oh, great, it's free. I'll just, I'll sign up for it. It doesn't say, actually, this comes at the cost of your data. And when you are, there was this great uh, online group to, I'm sorry, you look like you want to jump in. There was this great online group that uh, called the Facebook uh, Users Union. And they would, uh, they would, they would, use a script to figure out how much time you'd spent on Facebook, how many photos you'd uploaded, how many comments you'd left, and then they would generate a bill for Mark Zuckerberg and they'd said, this is how much <laughs> money you owe me for contributing website uh, maintenance to Facebook. Um, because in a situation like that, I mean, the user does become the product. They, they, if, if, in any kind of ad-based situation, that you know, it's your data is what's getting sold here. I think half the problem probably way more than half the problem. It's just that users don't even realize that's happening. I'd put the question back to you and to your clients, Joe. I mean, what's wrong with your clients? What's wrong with app developers telling somebody 
that actually you want the data and why you want it. And letting somebody make an informed decision. Absolutely nothing wrong with that, is there, whatsoever? Come on, guys. I mean, I prefer free, but I'm one of those rare beasts that also buys apps. But when we talk about free then, and when we talk about elsewhere, so I might download an app for you guys. You might d provide an update by the App Store. One of the biggest challenges you have is the fact that when I go to my smartphone and I want to update the security element of your app, because you put an update in the App Store, actually, frequently now, I can't download your update unless I agree to the terms and conditions and update a privacy policy of the OS entity who has some onerous terms in there that I don't agree with, which means that I can't use the latest functionality of your app unless I agree to that, and I have absolutely no choice because my only choice is to download it or give up on that OS, give up on that handset, buy another handset, invest in another OS, and lose all the money I've invested in the apps that I bought. So that actually is a barrier to choice, isn't it? And it's actually not very good for you, that particular business model. So we have five minutes left. I, I would like uh, for each of you to maybe have 30 seconds uh, left to, to wrap up. Okay, we have 30 seconds. I won't really do a wrap up. I'll just uh, echo some of the comments <laughs> that were just said. I mean, really this notion of free, uh, the, the problem is there's information asymmetry and free is not free. As Rainey really pointed out, uh, people are providing personal data that has economic value. Um, so, you know, that's something that we really need to think about and you, you, perhaps your clients need to think about. So I guess, you know, my closing comment is there's a lot of people at this conference who are technically oriented. They're going into the tech sector. They're building new pieces of technology that are going to affect people's lives. And I'd say that one of the most important things you can do and that we can do at, coming from this conference is think through, like when you, when you start to create something, create technologies that consider the privacy ramifications of what you're doing. Create technologies that are, that are free in the sense of freedom, not in the sense of doesn't cost any money. Um, create technologies that uh, create online environments that uphold uh, the rights and freedoms of everyday internet users because our communities are moving into these online worlds and this is our time and our, our opportunity to sculpt these online uh, communities in ways that will uphold free speech and privacy and, uh, and resist uh, government surveillance. So that would be my two cents. Okay, I, my, my two cents worth would be think privacy, give people choice, and keep it simple. Remember, people buy smartphones to have fun. They don't buy them to be bored with decision making. They want fun. Keep it simple. Put privacy first. All right, thank you very much for coming here this morning. Uh, the next panel here at this, present, at this stage is a presentation in five minutes uh, where the Internet Society and the Campus Party are signing an agreement and they asked for me to plug that at the end of this talk. So thank you very much uh, for being here this morning.